This is not psychotherapy. Dr. Wills does not have a provider-patient relationship with this guest. These are just two people talking about emotions. Hello, this is Dr. Alex Wills. I'm very stoked to introduce Give a Fuck Actually's very first, not including my daughter, guest ever, Paul Gilmartin from the Mental Illness Happy Hour. Welcome today, Paul. Ah, thanks for having me, Alex. I appreciate it. So I was going to read this uh, background quickly. I'm going to try not to crack up because some parts are pretty good. To introduce Paul from 1995 to 2001, Paul Gilmartin co-hosted TBS's Dinner and a Movie. As a stand-up, he has appeared on Comedy Central Presents and numerous other shows that everyone has since forgotten. <laughs> I didn't write this. He is a frequent guest on the Jimmy Dore show performing political satire as right-wing congressman Richard Martin. He is the host producer of the Mental Illness Happy Hour podcast. Paul is thrilled to be diagnosed with clinical depression in 1999 because it meant that he wasn't just an asshole. But, <laughs> sorry. By 2003, he realized he was still an asshole and an alcoholic. Since 2003, he has been sober, mostly happy, and a tiny bit less of an asshole. <laughs> About the mental illness happy hour, he hosts the weekly hour-long audio podcasts consisting of interviews with artists, friends, and the occasional doctor. The show is geared towards anyone interested or affected by depression, addiction, and other mental challenges, which are so prevalent in the creative arts. Paul's hope is that the show and this website will give people a place to connect, smile, and feel the return of hope. The biggest myth about mental illness is that you are alone and there is no help. So Paul was gracious enough to record me for his show a couple of weeks ago. And I was pleasantly shocked that he had actually read the entire book and had some very challenging questions and insights. In this podcast I'm launching today, Give a Fuck Actually, it's going to give our guests a chance to go deeper and explore some of their own painful, scary, or difficult emotions, also known as fucks, to see if radical emotional acceptance has helped or could help them to see their fucks as friends. But first, by way of introduction, Welcome, and thank you so much for helping me to launch this and being my very first guest. My pleasure. My pleasure. I, I'm very honored. So after all that, any history and highlights of the mental illness happy hour that you wanted to share for people who may not have heard of it and kind of where are things at now? Uh, I mean, we've done 623 episodes, so it's really hard to say, well, you know, listen, listen to this one. You know what? Actually, I think a good one. Um, it, it, it was from the first year and we replayed it. I want to say maybe in the last two years as a best of episode, um, God, maybe three years ago with Teresa Strasser. I think that is a, a good example of the show when it's hitting all the things I like in a good episode, which is vulnerability, truths that are difficult to talk about and, and humor. And uh, Teresa really checked all those boxes. But there's so many fascinating stories. There's a best of episode that's I just posted two weeks ago with Nadare Fenoyan, who was a freedom fighter in Iran after the uh, Ayatollah took power. She and her husband were uh, Marxists. And uh, a lot of people don't know that there were various factions after the Shah fell. There were various factions vying uh, for, uh, control. And one of the first things the Ayatollah did was to eliminate all of his political rivals through imprisonment and, uh, many of them through executions. So that's where her story begins. And it's a, it's a really fascinating, she, she's lived in the States for a long time, but it's a fascinating story. And I think really timely given, uh, what is going on right now and the push for women's rights and the oppression going on in, Great. Thank you. You know, my wife and I were going through some dark days like a few years ago, just kind of starting off with my mental health practice and all of the challenges of raising a family. And 
one of the things that kept us happy through it all was we we found a new hobby, which was going to see some stand up comedy. And uh, so my some of my passions are stand up comedy as far as being a spectator, at least, and mental health. And so to combine those two things and to have you on is just great. Um, is there any future direction for you and the show at this point? Are you just going to continue on making great content or? Um, you know, one of the things actually that I, I am thinking of doing, and I'm probably going to test it out the first couple of episodes of January, uh, you know, I have my background as a, as a stand up comedian and, you know, kind of typically my sense of humor is pretty dark. And while that does come out on the, on the podcast, it, 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 uh, in, since I haven't really done stand up other than doing the right wing character occasionally, uh, the comedy part of my brain was feeling kind of underutilized. And, uh, so I started writing satire that I couldn't really put on my social media stuff i felt like i couldn't really do it in the in the podcast but one of the things that i started really having fun with is posting fake wikipedia pages that are satirical <laughs> about whatever the subject is you know like the fifa world cup and you know, people that are big in the news and it's <laughs> kind of my my way of uh you know exercising that need to comment on society and i'm i'm thinking about uh integrating those into the podcast i don't know if it's going to stick out like a sore thumb or whatever but one of the nice things is i'm sure you will discover as you do your podcast is there's so much freedom to experiment and i think people that listen enjoy that even if something falls flat I think they enjoy things that don't feel like they're, you know, overly uh, overseen by some corporate entity. Nice. I'm a huge fan of satire, so I, I hope to see that. I hope it works out. That's awesome. Um, any other announcements or any upcoming guests you're excited about at this point? You. Ah. <laughs> you. It was such Whoa. a great conversation, and I, I really like what you're doing it it's uh i think a really fresh perspective on how to deal with our shit well thank you and yeah it was just such an honor to be able to come out there and to meet you in person and all that and and your dog um, who we will probably hear from before this episode is over fair enough we will intentionally not edit out any any dog <laughs> I've always had an intense emotional fear when it came to public speaking before this whole thing about, you know, two months ago, I had never spoke in front of more than like 30 people. However, I still have that intense fear, uh, yet I'm choosing to do it anyway, which kind of gets back to step four of radical emotional acceptance. Yeah. You've obviously done this kind of thing hundreds, if not thousands of times. I was curious, uh, how was the interview from your perspective when we came out there? And uh, at this point for you, when you do these kinds of things, are you just so used to it that you don't really have a lot of emotions come up? Yeah, I, I don't uh, uh, around speaking publicly. Do you mean? Uh, uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I really don't. Actually, if I have a, a, a fear, it's probably a fear of not being able to express myself, of feeling unseen. Um, I think... I think some people have a, a, an unquenchable thirst to have their experiences and their perspectives reflected back through them through feedback. Um, I think most people that get into stand-up comedian don't do it because they choose to. I think it chooses them and they do it because there is a need to do it. And, uh, I think for many of us, we couldn't find in our childhood, a healthy sense of, uh, as, as you guys in the mental health profession call it, um, um, 
Oh, what is it when, when you the, the parent uh, reflects back to the, to the child? Uh, right. That, that empathetic mirroring. Yes. So I, I think that is part of what drives me, but also one of the reasons I started the podcast was I'd gone off my meds in 2010 and really thought my, my life was worth, you know, wasn't worth living. And I was considering suicide and I didn't realize for a couple of months that, that was the depression coming back because I was off my meds. And so that kind of inspired me to start a conversation about uh, mental health because I thought I've been in therapy for years. I've been under the care of a psychiatrist. I believe that depression and addiction are all real things. And I got fooled by the the darkness. It would the podcast would be a good way to really get into the nitty gritty uh, of such a complicated topic. Yeah, I'm sure you've gotten so much, you know, positive feedback. Do you, do you hear uh, quite a few stories of suicides prevented people that you've helped through this? I mean, I imagine that, you know, you probably don't even know 10% of how many lives you've touched already with this. Well, when I do, yes, I, I have heard it. And it's really um, very fulfilling to have somebody share that with me. Um, so it's... It's very gratifying. It's very gratifying. And yet, on the other hand, I also have to make sure that I don't fool myself into thinking I'm there to save people and their, their life depends on me. I have to have boundaries. And, you know, I've many times directed people to suicide hotlines and say, hey, this is this is over my pay grade. I I am not equipped to be your uh, lifeline as a as a listener. Uh, I started the podcast to be a cheerleader for those of you that are in the trenches uh, providing the care, the psychiatrists, the therapists, the social workers, the suicide hotline. So um that uh, having a clear idea of where my responsibility begins and ends is uh, is very important for me. Awesome, especially as a uh, you know an egotistical demagogue. <laughs> Fair enough. So, well, where would you like to start? Or any examples of emotional fucks going on in your life now or from the past? Anything kind of on, on, off the top of your head right now? You know, I think the, the probably the, the thing that fucks with me the most is, you know, I had a history of being unfaithful and really kind of being a pig when I was on the road doing stand up and you know, I look back at it and the way I used and objectified women, um, you know, while I've made amends where I can, uh, it, it still haunts me that I have harmed people. And the selfish part of me also worries that, you know, somebody's going to come forward and say, you know, this guy was a pig. He badgered me into having sex with him. And that, you know, every, I'll be canceled. I won't be able to make a, a, a living. So while I understand that, that that is just my way of obsessing about myself and trying to control things that I can't control, it, it's still real and it comes up once in a while. Yeah, thanks. That's that's like a really great example that we can kind of uh, look into together if if that's cool. Sure. And I know you haven't heard the introduction to the show yet, but just to remind the listeners, this kind of goes without saying, but on the show, we of course don't do any psychotherapy. This is just two dudes talking about emotions with curiosity. Yep. If you are having mental health issues, we, you know, encourage you to see a professional if it's anything serious, you know. So yeah, I'm wondering, Paul, if you could just name name the emotions that you have without explaining why whenever you kind of think about the situation that you you just described. Fear, dread, um, sadness, regret, mm -hmm. self-hatred. 
I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, th I think those are the main ones. Okay. Oh, there's Gracie. I don't know if Gracie. you can hear her. Hi, Gracie. <laughs> so, yeah, th those sound, I mean, based on, you know, I think we've all done things in the past that we regret. We all, you know, look back and maybe wish we could have uh, chosen a different path or whatnot. And I mean, those sound like pretty, you know, normal emotions to have based on that, you know, fear, kind of a healthy fear, I guess you could say, because there, there is, you know, possibly there's some kind of a threat that we, that that's out there, even if the, the chances are pretty small, dread, sadness, regret, um, self-hate. I wanted to make a comment. So one of the points that I talk about in the book is trying to separate those pure emotions from any sort of stories. And I think of those raw, visceral emotions, pretty much everything you listed here, but I'm always paying particular attention when there might somehow be a, a story attached, right? So when, when I hear self-hate, it, you know, it makes me wonder, is there a story in there that, you know, uh, I might be a bad person or um, I might not be forgivable or, um, you know, so, some kind of a belief that might be kind of locking us into this story rather than the raw emotion. I, I think hate itself is just sort of a raw emotion that happens to us. Mm -hmm. But then if we start to attach a, a meaning to that, it can kind of transform into something else. Yeah, uh, th that's a great question. And I think you know, one of the, I, I was raised in a, a sexualizing environment by by my mom when I when I was a kid and my body didn't feel like it was my own there were boundaries crossed and sex kind of became my first drug you know obviously being a child it it you know it was just the kind of the show and tell that you do with you know the the girls your age but I remember it feeling like it was more important to me than it was to anybody else. And uh, as I look back on it now, uh, I think that's when an, an addiction started about um, sexuality being about validation and control uh, rather than, you know, as I got older, about being something that you share through vulnerability and trust. Uh, and while I do experience those things now because of the support groups I've been in for many, many years, I think that feeling that I'm dirty is is still lurking, uh, that, I, that, that I'm bad and probably even more thing, that I'm not, that, that people won't forgive me. And I'll be abandoned. Yeah. Okay. So some pretty, pretty deep, you know, concerns about, you know, possible consequences that, that may happen. And so to kind of, um, orient the, the viewers, the, the listeners, we kind of went through step two of radical emotional acceptance, which is to name the fuck we, we mm -hmm. named out the fear, dread, sadness, regret, the hate. Yeah. And now we're sort of camping out on step three, which is listen to the fuck yeah. or see what we can learn about um, these these emotions. And, and, and I'd also like to add that mixed in with that also is an awareness that this isn't just about me, that if I've harmed somebody, um, probably the most important thing is their healing and them regaining a sense of autonomy and safety in their life. Um, one of the things that I, that my eyes were open to and, and my support group, but was not only have I potentially affected them and their, you know, opinion on men in general, but I've also probably affected the men that want to have a relationship with them, with them, you know, potentially uh, not being trusted or struggling to get close to somebody that, that they're in love with. So it, it, I think it's really important for me to understand that this is a large thing with a lot of moving parts 
and um, it's important for me to wish uh, for 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 their healing. Right, right, and that sounds you know, and I, I definitely stand behind that. It's so important to consider you know. Um, their well-being and to be, you know, aware of any healing or help that they may need because of the past or whatnot. Yeah. One, you know, one of the the things that I that I look back at was my idea of um, consent back then was that it that it was okay to verbally pester someone. Instead of, you know, saying, oh, you know, they, they don't realize, even, even if they're not saying no, the fact that they're not, you know, wholeheartedly jumping into it. In, in my mind back then, that meant that it was okay to keep pestering them because I thought, well, if I'm not restraining somebody, uh, then it's not a violation, but, but not picking up on their body language. Um, it is, you know, that brings me shame. The fact that I, that I didn't do that. Yeah. And that's, yeah, it's important to, you know, it, it was almost like you were like, well, I'm not breaking the rules. Like I, I know what the right. rules are. I'm not breaking the rules. And so it's, it's easy to kind of justify. So it's okay. Right. Correct. Yeah. And so a couple of points, uh, one is, um, you know, we notice uh, with the five steps, you can kind of bounce back and forth. And what comes up a lot is we ch jump back to step one, which is those shield emotions, um, which also includes like defense mechanisms. Some of the common ones we might want to kind of think about rationalization, intellectualization, and the other one that comes up a lot is altruism. Like how, how can we be, you know, the, the giving good person and all of those are actually, you know, not bad things. Those are very good things. However, they also do shield us from sort of those deeper painful emotions that we're kind of getting to. And so I always come back to the question, how are these intense, painful emotions somehow good for you? Because who would want to live with nagging emotions of fear, dread, shame that can come up? hate, regret, like, why, why can't we just get rid of those? I, I just want to like <laughs> say, I'm sorry. I don't give a fuck. I'm really sorry. I don't give a fuck. And I want to move on. So what, what possible good is it that we, we have those emotions when we think about things that we did in the past? Well, I think, um, self-awareness is good. And obviously it can, you know, go to a place of, of unproductive self-hatred and self-obsession. Uh, so I try to keep that in mind. And one of the things that I, that I look to is, am I a different person than I was back then? And the, the answer is yes. Um, my female friends in my support group, uh, tell me they feel safe around me. In fact, I just got off a, a phone call with one, uh, who was opening up to me about something that she's going through. And the fact that she trusts me. And, um, and she feels safe being vulnerable with me. It, it means a lot to me. So it suggests to me that, that I'm not the guy that I, that I was before. I'm able to experience, um, intimacy, both platonically and romantically, romantically in my relationship with my girlfriend. So, um, an awareness is, I think, one of the things that I can glean from, uh, looking, looking back at this and learning from it and saying, okay, I can't change the past. What can I do moving forward? And what I can do moving forward is keep going to my support groups, you know, keep opening up to people, keep being there when they want to open up to me. And, um, so that it's not all just completely um, a shame, you know, and, and, and 
you know, I hope that doesn't sound disrespectful to the, um, somebody that I may have harmed or affected. Um, I hope that doesn't sound like I'm minimizing their, uh, experience. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And what I'm kind of seeing is, you know, it seems like both are true. You have, you know, these, these painful emotions. I mean, imagine if you didn't have any of these painful emotions, you, you might still be, you know, doing the same behavior or you, you may just really not care and you may, you know, never have grown. And so you can easily identify that, um, probably without these painful emotions, you wouldn't have ended up with that level of growth of self-awareness, personal growth, appreciation of your current relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, uh, the, the alchemy of these painful emotions is that it's turned into a motivation to help other people, which you actually are doing not only by talking about it right now, but with your activities and the groups. And so it's really magical how the, I think I'm really super happy. You mentioned the um, emotion of shame because shame is this hot fireball emotion that none of us want. It's, it's mm -hmm. awful. It just, your body becomes hot and you just feel like the devil. It's, it's so, it's so bad. However, it is such a powerful, painful emotion to really get our attention so that we can take a look at our relationships, yeah. at our behaviors, and we can say, how, how do I get right with my tribe? How do I get right with my community? Um, it's making us aware that we may have done something that's going to harm others that also might harm us, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's a great point. And, and I think, um, uh, you know, I think shame is one of the most difficult emotions to not let spiral because it's, it's easy to, to conflate who we are as a human with a mistake that, that we made or um, a selfish period of our lives that we look back on and, and feel terrible about. And I think it's important to also say, what is the, 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 the shame about? What am I in particular ashamed of? Uh, because it's so easy for all of those things to go back to the place of selfishness that I was in when I was acting out, mm. where it was all about me. Right. You know, there's, um, there's two ways that I've noticed a shame can spiral, to use that term. One is when we want to fix it. We yeah. want to get rid of it. Um, we want to somehow think of a way to not have this emotion or to go back in time and change things so that it never happened. And of course, that's a battle with ourselves. That's a battle with reality. That's a battle with our emotions. And so we end up spiraling with these um, ruminations going on and on. And the other way it can spiral is when we start to believe the story. We start to get wrapped up in um, what if I really am unlovable? What if I'm unworthy? What if I am deep down just, just horrible trash? What if I deserve to be punished? What if I deserve no forgiveness? And so we can get spiraling in that way too. Yeah. Uh, however, an alternative is to see that shame is good. You reminded me of just a quick little example. Years ago, I was driving my, my little sports car much too quickly on the road by my neighbors. And uh, I, I kind of kept upping the ante because nobody said anything. So I was enjoying this little windy road. Um, and then one day, one of my neighbors, I guess, uh, seemed to have had a bit much to drink and decided that enough was enough. And in front of my family came up onto my driveway and basically chewed me out. And I, I didn't know if he was going to kill me. I don't know if I was going to wow. have to defend myself. Um, it, th there's a little bit more to the story I probably shouldn't share on air, but I, I felt, you know, just this utter shame. I felt naked. I thought, oh my God, all my neighbors hate me. I'm they a terrible I'm this, person. I'm a terrible person. And, you know, as a psychiatrist using all of my psychobabble therapy okay. stuff for, for like a couple of years, 
I tried to get over this. I tried to meditate. I tried to forgive myself. I, I did. I did everything. I followed all of the steps, right? And it, it could never go away until one day I realized that I actually uh, am thankful for that shame. I'm thankful for that emotion. Number one, the emotion itself just woke me up. It slapped me in my face and made me realize I better change my behavior because neighbors are scared to death and, and they're very angry. And so that helped me to change the behavior. And whenever I think about it, I still get a tinge of that sharp shame as a reminder of like, okay, don't do that, you know? And so the reason I got stuck for so many years was that I was trying to fix shame. I was trying to fix an emotion. I was trying to somehow, you know, convince myself that it could just go away. And the other part of it too is I had to, you know, go through the steps and realize that I don't have to believe that that emotion of shame means anything bad about me. Mm -hmm. I, I did, you know, I made a mistake. I felt horrible shame for it and I changed my ways. I don't have to believe the story that I'm an able and that I'm never going to be redeemed. I don't have to believe the story that my neighbors hate my guts and are plotting my murder, you know? And, and so you have to go through and disbelieve all of those toxic stories that can get you locked in. Such a, such a, uh, a wise perspective on that. And, and I assume that you, the argument ended with you running him over at a high speed. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How uh, did you know? You know, uh, one of the analogies that somebody introduced to me in my support group was, you know, if we make mistakes, you know, if our, um, you know, we lose our temper or we're dishonest, you know, it's not proof that we are an unworthy person uh, uh, of love and we're bad to our core. It's that, you know, we just drifted out of our lane. A little bit and what we need to do is just get back in our lane and and it's easy to conflate that with i should have never been given a driver's license right and if everybody <laughs> finds out that i drifted out of my lane uh they're they're you know they're gonna never want me on the road again and they're all gonna talk to each other about what a terrible driver i am one hot tip to identify those toxic stories i'm glad you said the word should I used to have a little poster on my window here that said, should free zone. Because whenever yeah. we start to hear the shoulds, there's a danger that we're going to be shooting all over ourselves, yeah. right? <laughs> and the shoulds are always the story that uh, I, you know, life shouldn't be this way. She shouldn't be like that. He shouldn't mm -hmm. be like this. I should be different than I am. And that's just evidence of our battle with reality, which is always the problem. We just fail to accept reality. And my book is specifically applying that concept to our emotional reality because the emotions are just there to help us. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And it took me years in, to, in support groups to begin to battle the shoulds. Uh, sure, as you know, at the heart of most addictions is an obsession with the past and the future and having a difficulty making peace with reality in the moment. And for me, that's where you know, whatever you want to call it, higher power, spirituality, a sense of letting go of the things that I can't control began to bring me some of the peace that I looked for through drugs and alcohol and, you know, acting out, you know, whether it was peace or just, a, you know, oblivion, you know, that's a better word for what I was seeking, just a way out. And um, it's Reality is difficult to make friends with on, on any given day, but it's where the answer lies. And to me, the serenity prayer really boils it down to asking myself, what can I control and what I can't? And the things that I do have control over, or at least influence over, how can I bring principles to them that I, you know, would, would hope to aspire to that are embodied by people I admire or, you know, and, and all loving God, uh, easier said than done, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a lifelong pursuit, but I do find the more I practice it, the easier it gets. And at least the, the amount of time it takes me to find the truth in a situation gets shorter.
the the longer I've been in my support groups and, you know, asking for help and getting help and therapy and all, all of that stuff. Uh, but I am wired to immediately picture doom um, or obsess about the past. I'm curious. I've noticed that we will use the evidence of these pure emotions. You mentioned shame, hate, dread, and, and we'll, we'll use that pure emotional truth and data as evidence that our toxic stories might be true. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if that's happened to you and if you've, you know, been able to get any kind of insight into that. Uh, it, it, it's been uh, a lot of, of work. And I think that's where my support groups have helped me because the love and acceptance that I found there, you know, people have heard my entire story there and they love me. Uh, well, not all of them, but um, <laughs> those that are close to me, those that are that are my friends, I know they love me and accept me. They they tell me that, and that helped me let go of the shame because after enough years of hating myself and crying on shoulders, um, having them say, "But you're not that guy anymore," mm -hmm. and you are. Uh, you're lovable. Yeah. It, 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 it even makes me cringe a little bit saying that out loud because it feels like <laughs> I'm bragging and that, you know, tells me that I've still got some work to do. But my point being that after long enough, I began to think maybe they're not all bullshitting me. Maybe I am worthy of love. And intellectually, yes, I would. Uh, even back then I knew, yes, I'm worthy of love, but I didn't feel it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the real battle with our emotions comes down to is, yes, it begins with the intellectual counterpoint to the toxic emotion, but eventually it doesn't feel like we've made any headway until we feel the counterpoint to that, you know, it, it, at least to give it a battle. Yeah, I, I find that, you know, we can spend years in talk therapy thinking about things and understanding them and understanding the psych psychology of it all. And it can't, it doesn't necessarily change our emotional reality at all. Um, I often will, you know, encourage people to give themselves the experience of love. So, for example, if somebody's struggling, feeling unlovable or unforgivable, whatever it might be, then their homework might be to, um, you know, once a day or twice a day, give themselves the experience of allowing themselves to receive love from somebody else in spite of not being a perfect, shiny, <laughs> you know, <laughs> immaculate angel. And, and once you can experience that habitually enough that, Hey, you're, you're a great guy. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, just like everybody, you made some mistakes before, but that, that doesn't change the fact that you're accepted, you're loved, you're not going to be abandoned, you know, you're the doors open for you. And, and once you experience that enough, that's what rewires that right brain, emotional brain neurology. You have to experience it enough until it becomes the new emotional reality. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. You know, it's so easy to conflate mistakes with worthiness or unworthiness, you know, because if you really think about it, nobody says, I won't accept a friend that's not perfect. I think what we look for in a friend is somebody who can own their own shit. Right. Yeah. And we're, we're often, you know, we, we're so shitty to ourselves. I mean, I would never, ever judge and treat my friend like crap, but I hold myself to this standard, right? Yeah. That if I'm not perfect, if I, if I don't do everything just right, then it's so easy to get down on ourselves. And yeah. so one, one of the exercises that I'll, you know, do with my patients is I'll have them pretend to be their best friend or pretend that the issues are with their best friend and then practice, well, what, what are you going to say to your best friend? Are you going to say, you're a piece of shit, I hate you, 
go away. I never want to see you again. And they say, no, no, no. I'm going to say, I understand. I still love you. It's okay. And then the next step is to say that to themselves and to, again, practice that to make it a new reality. Uh, I love it. One of the most powerful things for me um, was talking to a picture of myself when I was young and innocent. You know, I have a picture of myself when I was, I don't know, eight, eight years old and my boundaries were being violated at home. And I looked at that picture and I thought, and I, and I remember saying, Hey buddy, I'm sorry you went through that. And I just started crying because I needed to look at that innocent picture of myself to understand that things happened to me while they don't excuse my behavior from then on, at least I can say, hey, it came from somewhere. I wasn't born bad and I'm working to be a better person. But seeing that kid's innocent face, it really um, got through to me emotionally because I think we often think of our, when we, when we think about our childhood, we picture ourselves as adults, but just two feet shorter. And we weren't, <laughs> you know, we were innocent and I was a good kid. You know, mm -hmm. I was a really sweet kid who didn't deserve the stuff that, that happened to him. Nobody does. Um, but it is what it is. And how do we move forward. I think that's the important thing. But I'm sure as you know, uh, childhood sexual abuse survivors, especially when the person who abused them is their caretaker, we minimize it to survive. Because right. the truth of I'm trapped in a house with somebody who isn't safe, it's much easier to say, I'm dirty. I deserve it. This is normal. You know, all the other stuff that we, that we tell ourselves and to be able to look at that picture and say, no, you weren't dirty. It wasn't normal. It was not acceptable. Um, and, and to feel that grief, to feel that loss, that sadness, that, that was really important for me. W would you agree that, you know, maybe that's how it starts, that we start to have our pure natural emotions, such as sadness, regret, shame, that just happen because of situations, um, we start to have those actually work against us because we, we have that belief that I'm dirty, I'm bad, I deserve this. And then bam, you get a dose of disappointment. Bam, you get a dose of regret. And it's like, see, it's true. The story's true. I can feel it. And so it's almost like gaslighting ourselves because these natural emotions that are just there to help us have been turned against us to fuel our false story about ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think something that is, that, that's hard for a lot of survivors to talk about is sometimes you know, when a boundary is being crossed and it's a sexually charged environment, even though the child doesn't want that, they can become aroused. And I got aroused one time in a situation that should not have happened. And, um, you know, it, it, it was inappropriate. I was like 12 and my mom's giving me a bath because I had some gravel in my knee. And I just remember feeling like I'm being tricked. This doesn't feel right. And, um, and I got aroused. And I think that was really when I got a tattoo on my brain of you're a monster. You are mm. disgusting. I remember going to dinner that night with my family to my favorite restaurant and I couldn't even eat because I was so sickened by myself. Mm. That sounds really intense. And, I, and, and a lot of survivors I've talked to have, have felt that way. You know, some, some people when mm. they're uh, being violated will, will have an orgasm oh, mm. or it will then become a, a part of their um, Rolodex of sexual fantasies as adults, you know, not because they wanted it to happen, because it, it's our brain's way of trying to control something that we didn't want to happen. It, it was a, a, 
a really important epiphany for me to understand that our our body can experience something at the same time uh, as our soul does, and our soul feels completely different about it. It sounds like you've really come so far, and you've really made you know so much progress, and the amount of insight you have. It, I mean. I guess, you know, you kind of mentioned that, you know, there's always more healing and more growth to do, but I, I mean, it sounds like you've really come really far out of the woods. Right? I think, thanks, Alex. I appreciate that. And I think it's the most important work that I've ever done. It's the most valuable time that I've ever spent. And I would have never imagined that, you know, the idea of getting help, asking for help, really looking within myself was so terrifying. I mean, you know, it was, uh, it was just opening a door. And I had a psychiatrist say to me one time when, as I was processing the, the sexual trauma stuff, um, he said, I, I, I want to congratulate you on turning around and looking into the jaws of the monster. And that blew me away because I had never thought of myself as, you know, potentially brave. I would always thought of myself mm. as a selfish coward. And the thought that that might be true, what he said, also helped me begin to let go of shame and all the, all the toxic kind of thoughts. At this moment, I'm having this intense emotion of just gratitude because I know very few people that would be able to articulate so well and willing to talk about this stuff publicly. And I just feel so touched imagining, you know, how many, how many lives are being helped because you are, you know, cur courageous enough to talk about things that other people need to hear that no one else is talking about. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. And yeah, it is a, a a little bit scary, but there is a little voice inside me that is like, you really want to change who you are? You really want to apologize for the guy that you were? What are you going to do about it? And, and speaking my truth um, publicly, I feel like is one of the ways that I can say I'm sorry. Maybe this will turn a light bulb on for somebody else. Maybe it's totally selfish. Maybe it's just, you know, catharsis for me to do that. But um, it, I get a feeling in my soul that, that it's a, yeah, that it's a ultimately beneficial thing uh, to, to do is, I don't know if that sounds, you know, I'm so afraid that I've sounded full of myself during this conversation. You know, the, the shame never takes a day off. Uh, <laughs> but I appreciate you saying that. that. That means a lot to me. Well, speaking of gratitude, I am very thankful that you, you actually read the book before we spoke. That's great. And, That's uh, great. Everybody should read it. And, and, you know, you're someone who's really been around and seen everything and talked about everything mental health related. And you shared that, um, the idea of the step five, which is thank the fuck or find mm -hmm. true gratitude for these painful emotions. You said that struck you as a sort of a new, newer concept and, and it really stood out to you. I was it, curious. It so, did because you know, I, that is. I'd always only taken it as far as accept the fuck. Mm -hmm. Thanking the fuck was new to me because while I could understand that pain in other areas of my life had helped foster growth, the, the, the negative emotions were always just something that I thought um, were unfortunate to experience. Not the ones that, that forced me to get help and work to expand my uh, consciousness and my boundaries and my respect for, for other people. But, um, I suppose in recovery, I, I'd always looked at it. Well, those initial emotions that made me go get help and, and helped me to see the wrongs that I've done and to apologize and to try to be a different person. But the toxic emotions today 
and until you said that, I realized, oh, I look at them as mistakes that I'm not doing recovery right. I'm really curious as someone who has been in the public eye for many, many years and has to deal with being known and the measure of fame, how does that play into and intensify these emotions for you? Because you're not just somebody that's going to just be able to be completely anonymous and disappear, you know? Um, I don't know that, that that's an interesting question because it's my normal and, um, you know, if, if, if you would say I'm in the public eye, I would, uh, I'd say both of those eyes are squinting. That's how much I'm in the public eye. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty below the radar. Um, but yes, more than the average person. And I think there's pluses and minuses to it. The, the, the minus to it for my brain is that it causes me more worry. But the plus to it is the good things that I do in life, you know, with the, the podcast, having vulnerable conversations, you know, both talking about myself and guests that I have on my podcast. Um, it's a plus that I have more ears listening to me. So, yeah, it's kind of a double a double edged sword. I, I imagined um, just kind of imagining if I you know were in your shoes, and at the beginning you mentioned the the fear of possibly being canceled or something like mm -hmm. that, and I was just imagining you know the, the intense pressure because if you know some consequence ever happened to you, the the damage could be pretty huge compared to somebody who just, you know, works, you know, do, doing something that, you know, doesn't involve kind of, you know, their the reputation so much? Uh, I think one of the things that, that helps me to cope with the intensity of those thoughts and feelings is to speak about it. Um, I suppose in a way, it, 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 it's a way of, you know, owning my story, but it, it, it's also, uh, it's a little bit scary, but I would say that, you know, the scary part of it is like 5% and the feeling of this is a good thing to do. It feels like about 95% of it. So, you know, after I have a comp, because I've talked about this many times on my podcast and on other people's podcasts. You know, I think that's where I, I, I got to bring the the universe into it and and just say, I feel like I'm doing the right thing. So let the cards fall or the chips fall where they where they may. Um, I ultimately how I feel about myself for my choices. This is one where I feel like I'm I'm doing the right thing with the. With where I am today. That's great. I've got a couple more questions as sort of an ending note. How might letting it be okay to give a big fuck or a small fuck change people's relationship with their own emotions? You mean caring about something? Or allowing, allowing yourself to consider the painful emotions the uncomfortable emotions as possibly there to help you in some way. I think it can help ease regret. I think it can help bring about a, a, a feeling of meaning and purpose because I think any time after something painful helps us grow or become more connected to other people through our shared struggle, there's a, I get a feeling of connection to the universe and to, and to my fellow man that was not there. 20 years ago before I got help for, for my, my issues and my seeking of oblivion. So sometimes it, there, there's this kind of delayed sense of meaning and purpose where we almost have to go on faith. Maybe it's driven by desperation that I can't live this any way anymore. I can't keep getting drunk every night to go to bed. Um, Maybe that drives our initial pursuit to get help. But I find that there's a momentum 
to wanting to continue to go to my support groups because I get a sense of meaning and purpose and peace and connection there that I was trying to falsely get from getting drunk or acting out or, you know, playing video games for 12 hours straight. Right. You know, that dancing with reality instead of, it, you know, wishing dancing looked like something else. Are there any other um, examples, anything else on your mind that kind of came up as we've been talking about this today? Anything else that you'd like to share? Don't, I don't think so. I feel like we've, we've covered pretty much everything that, that is fucking with me at the moment. The fucks that are, <laughs> are coming up, you know, I have a really good life. I have so much love in my life, both platonically and romantically. And I feel like, um, um, I used, you know, early in recovery, I felt like I was a cancer on society and I don't feel like that. I feel like I, you know, give it a, a little shot of medicine here and there. And that's a, that's a good feeling. And the irony is the driving force in that isn't as much for me to be a good guy as it is for me to not go back to being miserable. Well, I've learned a lot from you today, especially with the topic of coming out of a abusive, you know, childhood past. It really spoke to me and I think it's, you know, speaks to a lot of the people out there too. Where can people go to follow you, see the Mental Illness Happy Hour podcast and all that jazz? They can, and, and I just want to say too, that I accept responsibility for the, you know, the things I did as a, as an adult. Uh, I, I hope it doesn't come across as I'm saying, well, this is all, uh, you know, the fault of the, the experiences that, that I had. I, I, I hope that's clear. Um, people can find Absolutely. The, pod, the podcast at metalpod.com and, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, any, uh, you know, Apple podcasts or Google play or any of uh, that stuff. And you can find me on social media at mental pod. Paul Gilmartin. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you on as the first official guest ever. Can't say thanks enough. Thank you, Alex. Hey guys, thanks for watching. This is Dr. Alex Wills with give a F actually make sure to check us out on Apple podcasts or anywhere you get your podcasts. Thanks for watching. Make sure to check out the merch store. <laughs> RadicalEmotionalAcceptance.com Bye. Bye.